Good evening, class. I'm glad that we're all here um, finally after a computer glitch and a computer crash already. Hopefully this will be minimized today. But I wanna welcome you all to a special class that we have today on a special day. Today is Veterans Day. And so before we get started, I definitely want to wish everyone who either served in our armed forces or who are currently serving in our armed forces, wishing you all a happy Veterans Day. Um, I know that I have a number of you in, in all four of my classes. And so if you're not on here now, if you have served, just send us a chat, write in the chat box, um, what branch of the military you serve, things of that nature. We thank you for your service. I'm excited for today's class, so I will get started. Um, today, we are having a continuation of our discussion last week of financial education um, with the special lens of entrepreneurship. And so today we have two amazing individuals. You will hear from one, um, Mr. Javon Elliott, um, but uh, I definitely want to introduce you to Sean Lewis, um, who I've worked with for the last several years um, on some entrepreneurial ventures. He'll talk to you a little bit more about his background um, and why both he and Elliot are here, um, uh, or Javon Ricks rather, not Javon Elliot, uh, Javon Ricks um, are here. Um, so I'm excited for that. But before we, before we start with class, I want us to go over several housekeeping um, points. Our agenda today, as you can see, happy Veterans Day to everyone. Um, we'll have housekeeping, we'll have a guest speaker, and we'll have Q&A. Now, during this presentation, if you all have any questions, please, please put a message, send a message in the chat box. Um, if you can do that, um, then uh, when this Q&A, um, I can moderate the initial questions, um, and then we'll have an open forum um, for you to ask questions um, to the presenter or presenters. Any questions? No, it's a good deal. If you can, please turn your videos on um, so that we can be uh, engaging with, with, our, with our speakers. Also, this, this uh, class and next class, it will be a continuation next week as well, um, will be recorded and there will be a hyperlink um, to YouTube um, for it. I will also send the YouTube link of last week's class too. My expectations, you all know this, ask questions, think critically, build on your existing ideas, be open to criticism, but most importantly, let's have fun. Housekeeping, your CREB assignments. For the next, in the next couple of weeks, you will have your assignments due for your essay. Um, if you all have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask me next week. Uh, we'll have, you can ask me after class today. Um, but I, what I'll do between today and next Wednesday is that I will reread the assignment, um, ensure everyone have, have any, make sure everything is clear. Um, and this, I will be grading this um, through the same rubric that professors across the campus, across the School of Business and Social Services will be. So I believe you get a maximum of 32 points, um, which will go to your, your final grade. Um, and uh, I want you to, to be open and honest. If you, it's not about your content. Or it's, it is about your content, but it's, it's really about the substance. So there's no right or wrong answers, um, but uh, we, we're looking to see if you are writing clear, decisive messaging on uh, all we're asking for the CREB assignment. And the purpose of this assignment, like I said at the very beginning of the semester, UNT Dallas, um, receive uh, approval to do a study um, from the state of Texas to discuss um, workforce um, educational options for the next generation of employees um, and, and people in the workforce in Texas. And what we focus on is experiential learning, which will evolve into um, creating critical thinking or outside the box business creation. And so with the CRED assignment, it helps you walk through that thought process of differentiating um, the mindset of an employee 
of a corporate organization um, and morph that into either something that you can feel more passionate about within your job. So let's say you're in accounting, your passion is accounting, but you're doing something that's not in accounting. Um, this will help you kind of guide which direction professionally you should go to either create your own business or to get into an existing workplace or workforce um, that involves um, work descriptions that's more in your passion rather than you not able, not being able to um, work um, inside of what your spirits are. And so this is just going to talk you through that. Um, there is a, a cycle. Um, there, there are some explanations in the first and the initial assignment that you can read through. Um, and between now and next Wednesday, we can go over, we can discuss it um, via Canvas message. So send me a message. I should be caught up in my Canvas messaging. Um, so thank you all for your patience. October was a very challenging month. Um, I will not lie to you. Um, there have been some, um, with, with the political environment, um, that's really bogged me down. Um, also, I've had some um, work, some of my consulting business has really picked up in the last two months. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so, and, I, and, and, I, and I'll tell you two of the projects that's actually um, going to be happening. One is the New Park project, which is a 39-story building south of City Hall. Um, I'll be responsible for all the WBE procurement for construction and professional services. Um, and they just released the uh, plans for that building last week for the Dallas Morning, in the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Business Journal. So we are moving close to our shovel date, which is going to be April of 2021. There's also a 350, um, there's a $10 million, 350 apartment unit project that I'm a part of as well in Fort Worth um, that we are, I'm actually going through um, the term sheet now. So I've been doing a lot of a lot of that work for the, and I'm doing zoning work in Flower Mound, Lancaster, and Minnesota. So all of that stuff in October kept me busy. It's not an excuse, it's a reason. And so um, I thank you all for your patience. Uh, for the last four weeks, last month, you all have been great students and being patient with me. So I wanna verbally acknowledge that. Thank you all very much. Secondly, your Canvas assignments. Um, I have um, somewhat created, I've graded most papers uh, that's been due up until this point. Um, I have not graded any assignments that you all have done uh, that has a, a later due date. So let's say after November 11th, if you've done assignments or you've already done other projects that due dates are after November 11th, I have not graded those. Um, I will do that when those due dates are assigned. Rhythm, were you, did you all receive your emails from Rhythm now? Great, so y'all did. Did you all sign up and did you all, uh, would you all do me a favor while we're doing this presentation um, or, or right now, go to the website and start um, and, 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 add, and answer the questions for how you're feeling today, your mental capacity. Um, Autumn, I saw you were nodding your head. Um, did you experience the website? Do you have any um, um, any initial um, thoughts on it? Uh, it's a pretty nice website. Um, it has like your class list. Um, it has like your, how are you feeling? Low frequency, uh, high frequency, very high frequency. Um, I like how you have certain features where you can, you know, click on um, to make things a little bit easier to define how you're really feeling. I like that. Okay. Um, but it's really comfortable uh, going through easy to navigate. Um, and uh, it's a pretty good um, option where you could, uh, I guess, interact with the admin or the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I like that too. So it's a really nice app. Perfect. Good deal. Well, please, um, you all participate in that this week um, because we want to give, this is a test trial for Jake. Um, Jake Ganning, Sean, um, is an entrepreneur. who created an app called Rhythm and it determines, uh, it doesn't determine, it allows students um, to, and faculty teachers 
to, to state at the beginning of a class or a period how they're feeling, the type of energy. And then there's a corresponding exercise for a minute up to three minutes on how you can either elevate your frequency so that you can be more receptive to learning or, or teaching. Or if you have high frequency and you need to calm down, there's some meditative type exercises for a minute, two minutes, so that you can kind of get into a mode um, to learn. It's, it's from an entrepreneur up in Benton. Uh, he was our speaker last month, and we agreed to, to be a test trial for his, for his product. Cool. So um, that's just a brief uh, synopsis on that. Group presentation. Um, a lot of people, you all have gotten your assignments, you all have seen your midterm grades. Um, what I want to do um, in the next couple of weeks is to assign, assign times for you all to present your final presentation to me the last week of school. This is the week during final exams. Um, we are scheduled to have our final exam on Wednesday night at seven, the last Wednesday of class. Um, and within those two hour blocks, um, I will be scheduling, um, I'll be assigning your final presentation time. You all, each group will have 20 minutes, a 20 minute block to have a Zoom conversation with me where you all um, virtually present your business plan to me. Um, you will have 10 minutes to do the presentation. So it'll be 10 minutes total for your pitch and I'll, I'll have five minutes or so for a question and answer. I will talk a little bit more about this um, as we get closer to that date, um, but be on the lookout before Thanksgiving. Um, you will see an email from me to your group um, assigning you all's uh, time for your presentation. You don't have any questions. Thanks for the congratulations. Thanksgiving holiday. Um, I, I, I specifically put this here um, because Thanksgiving, this course is on a Thursday. Our class are on Wednesday. And I want to see who would love to have class the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. <laughs> Anyone? I must say yes, just because it's only going to be one yes. Smart man, Jose. Smart man. But you know, uh, what we'll do is I will be available for you, um, but we won't have uh, a lecture. So if you all want to log in um, and you have any questions either on your final presentations or some assignments uh, that you need to turn in before um, the end of the semester, I'll make myself available from seven to eight on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, oh, which is going to be I want because some people say, some people say November 18th, you say there was no class. No, that's not the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. November 25th. So Thanksgiving is November 26th. November 25th, we will not have a formal class uh, where we will have a new lecture, but um, I will be available maybe for the first 30 minutes to an hour if people have any questions. All right? Good deal. And we've already discussed all of them. I think we're in a good spot. This is 723. And I would like to uh, bring up Sean Lewis and Javon Ricks. Uh, I'll put Javon Elliott. I will change that. My apologies. Um, let me stop sharing so I can change that. Um, but while I change that, I want to introduce, introduce, introduce you all to Sean Lewis. Now, I've met Sean. Um, several years ago, um, he is not a native of Dallas, no. uh, but, but he and his wife, are you, you're from the East Coast, aren't you? Yeah, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from and, and your wife is from the West Coast, from the Bay Area. Yeah, both. My wife was born in uh, Oakland and lived okay. in uh, Berkeley, uh, but then she moved to L.A. as a teenager. Gotcha. And went to high school there and ironically went back to college in Berkeley at UCAL. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, Sean, Sean and his wife are very decorated professional. Um, Sean started in, in corporate, um, yep. doing things um, in IBM um, yep. and creating systems there. Uh, and then he branched out to be an entrepreneur. And that's why I met him. 
um, not only through business ventures, but um, we also um, done work with, through his um, wife's affiliation um, with her work um, in, in, in providing entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs specifically, um, with uh, tools and opportunities. I was a judge and a mentor for the Kidpreneur Program um, through um, T.D. Jakes' conference. Uh, I forgot, not the Power Networking Conference. Yeah, no, it was Megafest, actually, Megafest. here in Dallas, yeah. yeah. It was, Megafest was here in Dallas about three or four years ago. Um, in UNT Dallas, um, our professors actually mentored the contestants and the winners. And so yeah. I was able to build a relationship with Sean um, and his wife, and I'm honored that he's on uh, the call today. So, Sean, welcome. And please tell us a little bit more about yourself um, that I'm not already said. Well, class, thank you, Professor Houston, first of all, for having us and uh, inviting us into your, your class. Um, again, can you all, everybody hear me? I want to make sure I'm not speaking too loud or too soft. Great. Uh, as Matt said, uh, actually, I met him. We moved to Dallas about 10 years ago. My wife took a job for a guy named T.D. Jakes. She was his chief communications officer. Um, and how Matt and her first met is that Matt actually, or it was you or either who had heard of, headed up the Dallas Black Chamber wanted um, Bishop Jakes to come speak. Yeah, that was and me. From, that so, was yeah, I, I, yeah, I created, I created the State of Black Business program right. when I was chair. Yeah. And T.D. Jakes is our first lunch room, lunchtime speaker. Right. And mm -hmm. um, it was referred to my wife's office and she took that man on. She met Matt, like Matt, and from there, the rest is history. Um, at the time, I, uh, we had a cons PR consulting business prior to that before she took that job. Um, some of our clients included the NFL, um, Sprint, where we did marketing and consulting services. My background at IBM, as my said, Anna Hewlett Packard or HP, some people know it. I started off in sales individually as an uh, individual salesperson and then through the course of uh, my skill set, um, I found out I was very good at leading sales teams and created a very large and um, successful sales team at IBM. They recruited me to basically kick Dell out of their largest accounts. So that's what I, my claim to fame was in corporate. But I'd always, and I think this is kind of corny, um, but it's true. You know, I like to give true stories. Um, I wanted to uh, always be an entrepreneur. And when I first picked it up, believe it or not, I'm not going to date myself, but I will say I was watching a Leave it to Beaver show. And the father was teaching the son how to actually trade penny stocks. And that's how I first got interested in business. And I always wondered, well, how does business really work, right? You hear these widgets when you're in college. And I was educated at a school in, in the East Coast called Boston University. And my background started in mechanical engineering, but I switched to economics and math. So at that point, um, from there, once I got to corporate and was being successful, I decided I really did want to become an entrepreneur. That's when I left and partnered with my wife. We were in Boca Raton, Florida at the time, and we started up here in consulting business. And so what, um, basically out of that experience, I've made a lot of mistakes, even though we had some, some, was, some success, just like I made a lot of mistakes in corporate. So when we moved to here, I wanted to learn how I could possibly create a brand new business model and just not be a PR or marketing consultant to, fortunately, we had some very large clients and we also had some very small clients. And during the course of that, I started working on creating, I wanted to create my own FinTech app. And I have access to some really good engineers being a former IBMer. On the road to that, that's when Matthew and I, my wife introduced me to Matthew. And let me tell you, your, uh, Professor Houston is really well respected in this city here. So whenever I'm, I always check and I can tell when somebody is really well respected and thought of highly is I'll mention their name. And if you do this, and I learned this in corporate, if I say someone's name, and I see that person, particularly if they're a person of influence or power, if they smile when you say that name, then you know that they're highly respected. Nobody has ever frowned when I mentioned Professor Houston's name, so I can tell you you're in really good hands. So during the course of me wanting to develop this FinTech app, Matt, I recruited Matt to help me, and we were making some progress, but I never got the traction I wanted to. So I decided to invert my business model. Um, 
simply to, instead of be, being a fintech app first, I said, I'm gonna build a financial services practice. And I was fortunate enough to have met Javon Ricks, who's gonna be our presenter tonight, who's a very success, had a very successful financial services practice, particularly with uh, different financial services firms where he was able to be one of the top producers in his field and getting people to create generational wealth within particularly black and brown communities. So when I found that out, I was already working on my FinTech app, but it was gonna be targeted for high net worth people first. And then I was gonna bring it more down to, to the affluent and then the underserved community. So when I talked to Javon, I said, hey man, we should maybe work together. And that's when I said, we should reach out to Matt and see if something we can see if introducing these concepts, but not to sell you anything, but to give you just an education about real world experiences as an entrepreneur. So we're gonna to start tonight with, with Javon and he's gonna just talk about the basics of how your mindset should be and how you should think about financially. You may see some of these uh, concepts already, Professor Houston may have shared with you, and then I'm going to follow up next week with you and I'm going to teach you how to operate a business. Basically, there's going to be four areas I'm going to cover so that you can see how you can start a business and sustain it. That's the most important thing that I experienced as an entrepreneur. So without further ado, my three minutes is up. I want to turn it over to Javon Ricks and let him take over. How's everyone doing today? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, first off, uh, I want to thank Sean. Sean's been uh, great to work with, and uh, it was a pleasure meeting uh, Matt uh, or Professor uh, Matt. Uh, forgive me. That's all right. We we've been in the same uh, circles uh, for a minute. Uh, I I know. I think I've seen him a couple of times. I think we've seen each other on LinkedIn and everything. Uh, I'm not going to throw anything out there, but we are fraternity brothers. So. Um, we do kind of, <laughs> so we do kind of, we, 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 we've known each other from those circles. I've been in Dallas Fort Worth area since 2012. And I'll give you a quick synopsis of um, my, my past. Um, graduate of Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas back in 1998. I got my insurance license in 1998, literally two months after I graduated. And I initially uh, ended up going the P uh, property and casualty route, which is home insurance, auto insurance, um, 18 wheeler insurance, boat insurance, motorcycles. I ended up specializing in 18 wheeler trucks. And I knew nothing about what I was doing, but a gentleman saw me working at a bank and he said, would you like to learn the insurance business with 18 wheelers? And I was like, well, sure, I don't have anything else to lose. Uh, now, mind you, I had already tried to get on a New York life prior to that um, unsuccessfully, but uh, the gentleman showed me the ropes. Uh, I did not realize how lucrative that field was, um, but when you start having to pay $8,000 to $10,000 a year for insurance for an 18-wheeler, and then you're making a 20% commission, and, and you start to kind of add all that up, uh, then I got smart and said, okay, I don't want to talk to anybody unless they have three trucks at least. And that's kind of what took uh, my career off. Uh, I ended up going to a luncheon. Someone said, well, have you thought about selling life insurance to those 18 wheeler truck drivers? I'm like, no, but that's a good idea. Went back, circled back, started selling the life insurance to those drivers. And uh, that's kind of how my life insurance uh, career took off. Um, I eventually ended up migrating out of that uh, quick story. And this is just life. So everyone's probably had a, a situation like this in the workforce. Uh, if you're not in the workforce, trust me, you will have one like this. Uh, the owner's son was in college at uh, University of Arkansas at Fayetteville, and he flunked out. So his dad brought him back home and said, you're going to work the business. So all of those contacts that he was giving me, he started giving to his son. He was kind of like, all right, fiend for yourself. And uh, I was like, you know what? I stayed with it about two or three months, and I was like, I'm just gonna start focusing on life insurance. So that's what I ended up doing. Spent some time, um, MetLife, Mass Mutual, New York Life, where I spent the most of my time. And uh, that's really where I learned the skill of, of life insurance, learned the skill of financial planning, and found out that I really liked the retirement planning aspect and the financial aspect of it. 
Um, so I'll say this right up front. I tell people this every day. I love talking stocks, bonds, mutual funds. That is what I'm good at. I love designing and implementing those plans. But I tell people, if you do not have life insurance as the basis of your foundation, then you're missing the boat. And uh, the last slide is where we'll kind of talk about that. But I tell people life insurance is just as important as auto insurance, which by law you have to have, as well as homeowners insurance, which by law you have to have. And uh, after being in Texas, I'm realizing that renter's insurance is a law based on the, if you stay in an apartment complex, they tell you you can't move in unless you have renter's insurance. But there's no law for life insurance. Can't figure that out. And I know a lot of y'all can nod your head and you've probably seen people or you know people where they passed away and there were GoFundMes, uh, car washes, uh, chicken dinners, um, barbecue plates at the church, fish dinners. That's why I really believe regardless of how much money you save, life insurance is an integral piece of uh, what we need to do. So I'm going to get right into it. If you have any questions, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, speak up uh, so I can kind of hear you because I won't be, I don't think I'll be able to see you. Uh, I think it kind of moves to the side. But if you've heard some of this stuff, be patient. A lot of it is just basic planning. I'm going to kind of go over what we've seen in the past. And then I understand that a lot of you all are non-traditional students. So you're already in the workforce. So some of these things may help. And if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me. So now mind you, I'm not a computer genius. So uh, we'll get this working here in a second. No worries, we'll exercise grace. Um, for, for the context, um, before we get started, remember this week, uh, we're gonna focus on personal finances because based on my presentation last week, one of the indicators that um, investors, bankers, um, venture capitalists, um, one of the um, identifiers, indicators of uh, a way that they want to do business with you is to see how you're able to personally um, manage your individual finances. If you're able to do that first, then they can feel uh, a bit more comfortable in trusting you with a larger amount of money. It's like right. it, if it's a it's like a biblical um, story with the three the three uh, three guys and the ten talents, um, and and you need to have one. You need to have five or you're going to have 10. Um, the question is, what are you going to do with them? We'll talk about that next week, but go ahead, Jamal. Okay. Uh, you're, you're exactly right, uh, Brother Houston. Uh, what, what I've learned is the, the more I paid attention to my personal finances, the better my business got. Uh, and I'll be honest, I tell people all the time, when I started and tried to get a New York life, they turned me down. It took me three tries to get out on the New York life. They turned me down the first two times because my credit report was messed up. And I, I contribute that to college. Um, and I guess I'm revealing my age. I'm, I'm 45, went to college, graduated in 1998. We didn't have these type of classes when I went to college. And my parents were both educators and they're older. Uh, my father passed away three years ago, but my mom is still alive. She's 77, 78 years old. That generation did not talk about finance. So when I went to college, and luckily you all probably don't see this anymore, they had tents your first week with these little flags and you know those little men that wave in the wind, and they get you to come by the tent, get a credit card, and they, you know, that's what I experienced. Don't forget and, the T-shirt. And the free T-shirt, yes. Don't forget the T-shirt. And everybody on campus had a T-shirt, and I don't know if everybody took a credit card, but I fell into that trap, and. As you know, once you fall into a debt trap uh, of credit cards and things like that, it takes a while to dig out of it. So um, that's why I say, as I learned and I started making more money and developing a budget and things like that, things did get a little bit better. So uh, so what I like to do is I like to talk to, about living debt-free and truly wealthy. Everybody likes to talk about debt-free. None of us wants to pay bills, uh, although we, a lot of times we have to. And then truly wealthy. And wealthy is not a is not a number assigned to that. It's what an individual is comfortable with. If you're comfortable with having a million dollars in the bank when you retire, great. If you're comfortable living off of thirty thousand dollars and you're able to do everything you want to do, perfect. So I never try to assign that to anyone. Uh, so 
uh, what I'm going to say today is in this educational workshop is educational purposes only. Uh, the goal, and usually I do this for families, but individuals, is just to help you all understand how to become debt free. So we're going to talk about some of those strategies, how to establish an emergency fund, which I'm going to ask you guys questions about that. Um, if you're in the space of retirement planning, it's never too early uh, and it's never too late. Um, you probably will believe and some of you won't believe. I have people 50, 55, 60 years old telling me, hey, um, I don't have anything saved up for retirement. What can I do? Um, my most recent was last year. I helped a lady who literally was 60 years old. She was a nurse and she's a nurse in Houston. And she says she's going to work another 10 years because she has to. What can she do? And um, I, I told her, well, the first thing, well, what are you doing with the 401k? Oh, I'm not really participating in that. And the first thing I said was, that's the first step because you're missing out on free money. And then, of course, we were able to start working on some other things. And then, of course, uh, we're going to talk about uh, strategies to help achieve financial security. So I'm going to try to go a little bit faster through the beginning because the last slide is really where I think you guys will want to take notes, pay attention, ask a lot of questions. And I'm going to uh, throw in some nuggets that have been very beneficial to me, and hopefully they'll be beneficial to you. Now, I tell you, be open-minded to new ideas. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. Uh, that's definitely not what we're trying to do. Uh, this is just for informational purposes. Um, be willing to suspend your disbeliefs. Uh, some things are going to be said here, and you're going to be like, what? I've never heard of that. And trust me, it, it's out there. Uh, when it comes to finance, this is the one area where I can literally tell you, you will not believe half the things that are going on because everybody is different. Uh, you have people that come from lots of money and don't know how to manage it. Uh, you have people that come from no money and end up inheriting a lot of money. Uh, you've heard the stories of people who played a lottery and five to six years later, they're completely broke. This industry and your personal finance is, it, there's so many integral parts and so many plug and play pieces. You really have to buckle down and pay attention to it. I will tell you, it wasn't until I started spending about two to three hours a week focused on my finances that things got better. And people don't believe that, but you have to look at your credit card statements. You have to look at your bank statements. Uh, the best thing for me was years ago when I got, uh, when I had the app for my uh, banking and check, my checking accounts on my phone so I could see every day because if you don't see it, you know, and um, another thing is what I hated was I, I love checks. I'm still a big check guy, but I know everybody uses debit cards these days. Some of you on the phone probably don't even, I've never seen a check. I don't know. I'm, maybe I might be making jokes but everything is gone to that little credit card or debit card. And if you don't know about the checks, you know, you write a check. And if I write Professor Houston a check and he leaves it on his desk for a week, I'm thinking that the check, even though it may just be $50, I'm thinking that it's already through and I don't know, you know, what's there. Uh, so luckily, uh, as things have advanced, you're able to uh, see that uh, and it's able to help you. But paying attention to spending two to three hours a week on your finances is very, very interesting. As well as when you become a business owner, um, you need to spend that same time on your business that you do on your personal uh, finances. So the last thing is, before we really get started, just sit back, relax. Like I said, put your checkbook up, uh, your wallets away. We're not going to talk about anything like that. Javon, I, I just realized the one that I see on the screen is not the one that I was the one that was the final one. I can share my screen and you can just keep talking and tell me to go to the next slide if you want. Oh, okay. All right. Matt, can you enable my screen real quick and I'll share my screen? Make me co-host. I just made you a co-host. Thank you, sir. All right. Let me share my screen. Hold on, let me find it. Yes, okay. There we go. There you go. All right, so I'll just tell you next thing. That... Yeah, and let me go to um, make it uh, for you. Uh... Oh, wait. Is that the right one? That's the one you got? I don't have, okay, go ahead. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, something happened in the email, obviously. Okay. Let me, let me just go one, do one more thing. Make your presentation, uh, come on. Okay. 
I'm going to, there we go. And that way it makes it easy. There you go. Okay. And you just tell me next. All right. You can go on about, I think we're three in, three or four in. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've talked about that one. Okay. And here we go. All right. We're going to talk about some interest rates. So uh, real quick. Whatever interest rates I use, this is just illustration purposes only. This is just to get you to kind of understand uh, money and what the thought process behind everything. Uh, all right, next one. All right, so here's some, th this is where I was saying everybody's going to uh, kind of agree on a lot of this stuff. Uh, when we watch the news, when we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is, um, you probably even heard a lot of this from uh, classes and uh, books that you've probably read, but everybody talks about consumer debt is just out of control. Um, when we get to right now, we know it's about to get very, very bad simply because it's the holiday season. It has nothing to do with COVID, has nothing to do with the election. It's just the holiday season. And what do people do during the holiday season? We want to spend all of our time and all of our money on going out, having parties, which I know is, you know, we're in a different time right now. So in the past, I'll say it was going out, partying, uh, having uh, get togethers, having gift exchanges. You want to buy everybody in your family gifts and people go into debt during this time. Well, they go into debt the other nine, uh, 11 months out of the year, but consumer debt is something very big. The other thing is minimal savings. They always say 95% of America doesn't even have $1,000 in their savings account. Mm. And this is this really shown itself since March of this year. As we know, when you have so many millions of people looking forward to a stimulus check of nothing but $1,200, that lets you know that this statement is very true. So we're having to figure out what can we do to make sure we have uh, um, that at least $1,000 uh, worth of savings. Now, I can ask you a question. I know some of you are on mute, but uh, they always uh, ask, what is the minimal amount of money that you should have saved up? Does anybody know the minimal amount people say you should have? Six months. Who said six months? Yeah, six months. Six months is optimal. Perfect. So they, they say three months is minimal. Six months is perfect. Twelve months is, is great. So those are the type of things that we really have to start uh, talking about and thinking about. When you're starting a business, the same thing, you have to make sure that you have that money set, set aside in the savings account. Just so uh, bankers and lenders can also see that their money season over there. Same thing as if you were buying a house. The other thing is stock market losses. I can't speak to that right now because it's inflated and it's artificial. Uh, the stock market seems to be doing great despite what's going on in the uh, in America right now. But normally in normal times when the government is not pushing in federal dollars to keep the stock market propped up, stock market is very volatile. Uh, you could tell that it was volatile on uh, Monday uh, when the stock market shot up after uh, they found out that um, over the weekend, the uh, presidential election was pretty much uh, solidified. Also, if you notice it shot up right after um, uh, they came out with the so-called uh, vaccine that they think is going to help uh, control COVID. Those two instances, the market shut up. Now, mind you, tomorrow if we find out that you know we hit 300,000 from today as far as deaths with COVID, you'll see the market go down. So you have to be very careful with that. Also, low interest rates. The fact that interest rates are so low at this time, uh, the federal government is little, uh, the um, uh, not the federal government, but Actually, uh, who is it? Not the FDIC. I'm having a brain freeze for a minute here. Um, Federal Reserve. Yeah, the Federal Reserve. Thank you. Uh, they haven't increased interest rates in over a year, year and a half. Uh, we also know that there's, uh, the federal debt is, is going uh, crazy. Questions about Social Security benefits. Uh, when it comes to millennials, I hear people, um, I have a, a two kids high school. Well, uh, one's a senior, one's a sophomore. And they keep telling me, well, Social Security doesn't matter to them because they know they're never going to get it. Millennials think the same way. Uh, and some of us who are older, we're wondering if we're going to get it. So uh, we always have to be careful and, and think about that. Uh, the, the other thing is you start looking at uh, 
uh, rising house prices uh, simply because of uh, tight supply and demand. Uh, jobs seem to be going away, lost wages, uh, lower benefits, and of course, uh, we didn't expect this global pandemic to occur. Uh, next. So this is something that everybody has seen. This is something that's in books also. So this is not something that I created, but uh, unfortunate facts about life. Uh, out of 100 people who reach age 65, 36 will be dead. Uh, 54 of them will be financially embarrassed. Five will still be working. Four will be financially secure and only one will be wealthy. So I'll be honest with you, most seniors that I know are still working. Uh, whether it's part-time, whether it's just still working a job, they're still out there. They don't feel that they have enough money set aside um, or things tend to get in the way. A lot of seniors worry about medications. A lot of seniors are still raising children. They're raising their grandchildren. Uh, so there are a lot of things that play into that. But I always tell people, you want to make sure that you're at the, the bottom of this list, um, you know, either being financially secure or being wealthy. And we're going to talk about some of the things to kind of get started there. Um, Siobhan, expand just a little bit. I know you don't have a lot of time, but uh, talk about financially embarrassed, what you've experienced in your practice, because you've been doing this for almost 20 years now. So, and like I said, you've done a lot for the black and brown community. Kind of expound on that, what you've seen in real life. What does it mean to be financially embarrassed? So, um, the, the students can realize what that means in real terms as they go through their walk in life, right? All right. Uh, when we talk about financially embarrassed, um, I, I don't mean that as in a negative term, but it's just, it is what it is. I'll give you an example. A uh, lady that I know uh, recently passed away. She was 67 years old. She'd been on uh, disability, uh, SSI disability. Her income was Eleven to thirteen hundred dollars a month. Now, she still had to have a place to stay. She still had to have a car to get around. She still had to have insurance, and of course, uh, she still had to eat. Now, when you add on that medications, that even though they may be on um, Medicare, Medicaid, doesn't matter which one they're on, they're still medications. Now, a lot of times the medications are subsidized. And a lot of times the uh, doctor visits are subsidized, but there's always that copay when you go to the doctor. There's always that copay on medications. How far does $1,300 go? I'll be honest with you. When you add up a $200, let's just say $200, $250 car, now you have to add in there a $200 insurance rate. That's four to $450 right there. We haven't even talked about the place to stay. We haven't even talked about utilities, which I didn't mention. And even if you ate food at uh, $50 a week, which, you know, we go out to eat and we spend $50 just on two people. Um, um, okay, I'm sorry, more, you know, uh, don't let it be a date, then it's really expensive. So those kind of things tend to, to add up. So that's what I'm talking about when it comes to people becoming 65 years old and not having enough money to make it. Um, and then of course, they're still trying. Uh, they still have to live every day. Um, and you never know when this is not, a, don't have a flat tire. Uh, don't allow your air conditioner to go out, things like that. So that's what I'm talking about when we talk about financially embarrassed. And that's something from a real life client that I've seen uh, who really just wanted to have a small life insurance policy so that her, her children didn't have to scrape up money. And it was hard finding 50 to $60 to take care of that. All right, next one, Sean. All right, here's what, once again, it's a generational gap, so I know. The big American dream was parents and grandparents said, go to college, get a good job, buy a house. Guess what? Pay that house off in 30 years or as soon as possible and save a little bit of money each month. And my grandparents and my aunt and uncles, they said those very same things. And I had one aunt and uncle who literally were able to do all of that. So that was the great American dream. But now, if we go to the next slide, this is the reality. 
that was great advice back then. Our grandparents, parents, great grandparents. They all lived in the same house for one for their lifetime. They had one job. My uncle worked for uh, what is it? Uh, it was, gosh, I can see the emblem is green and white. He was a lumber grader. So his hands were very rough, and he, as the lumber came through the uh, through the platform, he could use his hands and he could grade and tell you this is grade A lumber, grade B, grade C, grade D just by his hands, just by touch. Now they have machines that do that, but that's what he did. He, Westenhauser, he worked there for 35 years. He had a great pension, saved money, had a little barbecue shack, had chickens, he had land, built his house, everything. Um, so he retired with the pension. When we talk about pensions, how many of you all think you will have a pension when you, when you retire? Not many companies. When the 401ks came into existence, the majority of the pensions went away. That was their way, that was the company's way, and that was the government's way of saying, putting that responsibility off of the companies, off of federal government, and putting it back on us. We could pretty much count on our hands, uh, and if we were all in a group, we could, I could use a chalkboard, and you all could throw them out to me, and we could get almost every single company and every single uh, employer that still has a pension right now. Number one is the federal government. They're one of the only ones still left having one. And that includes teachers, that includes postal workers, that includes people that work for the state and the city and, and the government. Now, when you get outside of that realm, you don't have that many. Most people are grandfathered in if they have a pension. I can't, I'm really struggling. The rail, I think the railroads still have one. Insurance and financial services still have one. Um, and I'm really struggling to, to think about anyone else. So, you know, you could put in the chat if you know of any, but they're not a lot. Everyone has gone to the 401k plan. They didn't have credit card debt, our grandparents or great grandparents. They didn't have credit cards back then. They might have had lines of credit at the stores up the street, you know, uh, that was about it. They saved a little bit of money every single week, every single paycheck. And they knew Social Security was going to be there before um, our uh, illustrious. Uh, senators and uh, everyone got a hold to, to the social security plan. Next one, Sean. Now, today, 2020, and this started happening before 2020, how many of us have moved four to six times in our lifetime? I can tell you that I have. I started out, I, I moved from Little Rock to, uh, Baton Rouge, to Shreveport, Louisiana. Left Shreveport, moved to Baton Rouge, left Baton Rouge, moved to Grand Prairie, Texas, left Grand Prairie, Texas in 2015, moved to Mansfield, Texas. Had three to seven jobs in our lifetime, but well, we're not even going to go there on me. That, that's, that's ridiculous. But how many people have had two or three jobs already? You know, people, a lot of times, because of the, the situation that we're in now, people want to be valued, and a lot of these companies just don't value people. And so, therefore, that's why this class... Uh, that we're talking in that you all are sitting in now sir, is important because so many people are saying, hey, count on yourself. We, we see what happened with COVID. How many people ended up losing their job every single week? Millions a week for 22, 23 weeks, millions of people. The lowest number in that time that I remember was 800,000. So that tells you right there, count on yourself. Uh, Right now, you need two incomes just to live. If you have children, you know, and trust me, those of you who have young children, I wish I was in your spot. You know, like my dad used to tell me, the older they are, the more they cost. Oh. You know, um, I'll tell you now, my son, he's a senior. November 1st were a lot of the college's deadlines for applications. I spent over $200 sending out college applications. I have a reprieve until January 1st when all the other colleges want their applications in. And that's, and that's gonna be more because they're Ivy League colleges. So it only gets more expensive. So it takes two incomes just to manage day-to-day -day life. Um, even if you don't have two incomes, how many people have a roommate? How many of your friends that you know or relatives, they have a roommate? Because it's just expensive, period. Uh, you pretty much know we're not going to have a pension. We're going to have a 401k. People are struggling with credit card debt. You know, if you don't have the cash, what do we do? We put it on the credit card. And then when we get the credit card statement every month, what do we do? We pay the minimum. 
They said pay $50. Now you owe $2,000 on the credit card, but you only paid 50. Now that's good because you want to keep your credit great, but you only pay 50. How is that helping out when it comes to your credit score? That's another thing we can talk about later. We've saved very little money. As we talked about earlier, a lot of people don't have $1,000 saved up. Then of course we worry about social security or we pretty much say social security is not going to be there. All right, John. So how do we keep this great American dream alive? Well, we have to get back to the traditional ways of how we manage money. How many of you all have a budget? Yeah, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. Look, Professor Houston says he has one. I have one. Now, Sean has one. Uh, I can't see if, it, oh, okay, I see Holly says I do. Uh, I see, looks like Autumn raised her hand. I can't see it. I only see four or five pictures. So if some of you all are on there saying things, I'm sorry, I, I don't see you. Okay, Carletta, see, I, I'm seeing it. Five in the chat, okay. okay. So let me ask you this. When you set your budget, do you just set oh, the budget okay, and put cool. what, your, what your line items are? Because I figured out a way that, that really helped me. I took my budget and I said, okay, I have 100%. 50% goes to needs. 30% goes to wants. 20% goes to safety. At first, it was very difficult because when I started allocating everything and trying to put them in slots, trust me, it was skewed. Oh, my needs man. were way more than the fifty percent. My wants were way more than the thirty percent. You know, they crossed over, and then my savings was like, you know what, you want to save, but guess what, you can't. You don't have any space, and so I had to work that out. Uh, oh, look, somebody. Okay, somebody said they know where every penny goes. Well, you can come in as mine because I don't have any clue. Uh, so when you get that savings piece, you're like, oh, I should be saving 20. So what I started doing was saying, okay, if I can start off by saving five, and then I started trying to cut out, cut off things, um, everything like certain credit cards, I tried to combine those. My family loves Netflix and uh, Hulu and all that stuff. So I have a problem. I don't watch all that stuff. So somebody else in the house has to pay that, and that's my wife, because I'm not going to pay it, because I don't watch it that often. But my daughter and my son, yeah, they figure that out. But there were so many things that I realized that I was paying that, okay, if I can either hurry up and pay them off, which means I could take that part of that savings and double down and pay off a credit card here and try to free up some money there. So once I started getting to the 50, 30, 20, everything started working a little bit better for me. All right, so that goes to we have to find ways to cut the expenses without changing our lifestyle, which it doesn't mean it's going to come immediately. It doesn't mean that it's going to be overnight. It takes time. Uh, like I said, I was, I, I won't lie to you, my credit score at one point was 480. Last time I checked, as long as you had a social security number, you had a, you could get 400. So that's how bad it was coming out of college. I never understood that because no one told me that. New York Life, when I applied, they just said, oh, you owe too much. And, and honestly, when I looked at it, I didn't owe a lot. It was less than $5,000, but because I wasn't able to pay it, they said I owed too much. Uh, the other thing is we have to find ways to make all of our money and assets work for us. Um, that's a little bit difficult starting out, and I tell people that up front. When you're not making a lot of money, you don't have a lot of money, how can I start saving? Well, first off, like I said, before we can start talking about the stock market and investing here and there, you have to make sure if something happens and you lose your job, you have enough money to make it until you find another one. And once we start doing that, and once you have your three months, six months, 12 months set aside, now we can start playing with where can I invest? What can I invest in? And I always tell people, only invest in things that you know about and that you like. Because if you don't know anything about the railroad industry, Okay, don't invest in the railroad industry. If you don't know anything about pharmaceutical, except the fact that you take uh, you know, medications, don't invest in medications. Now, you have children, you know about Nike, you know about McDonald's, they'll tell you that. We know about Under Armour, you, you know about Gerber, you know about Procter Gamble, Tylenol, you know about those things because you've been around them and you know they're successful, they've been there for a while. But when people start talking about, oh, well, let's invest in tax liens. What do you know about tax liens when you don't own a house yet? 
you don't even know that you have to pay property taxes. You don't even know what the tax lien really is. So you have to study up on it. Not saying that you can't learn it, but I tell people when you really want to start that, then we have to start learning, doing, doing it in the areas that we know first. And then, um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm reading what Holly <laughs> wrote, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, then of course we have to establish better priorities in, in our financial lives. What's important? Do I have to go hang out with my friends or go to dinner every week or should we cook at home for a while until I get things better or until a job comes along better, until I pay off this car or, or whatever it may be. I tell people now, if I was to do it all over again, when I graduated college, I would have worked two full-time jobs because now that I look at it, you can party later on. You know, um, older people, we, we could tell you right now, you know what? It's better to go on vacation now that we're older. We have vacation time. We can go to Cabo. We can go hang out for a week, you know, in Las Vegas. We can go to every football game. Like I tell people, I have a bucket dream. I want to go to every NFL stadium before I pass away and watch a game. I'm working on that. Every single year, I'm picking out one going to it. When I'm young, okay, yeah, I'm just going out, you know, spending money, hanging out with people who really didn't care about me, you know. And I always have the same joke and females may get upset, but I promise you, I wish I had some of the money back that I spent when I was dating women back in the day. Because a lot of times I realize as I'm older, they just wanted the free meal. I wish I had taken the time to, to work two jobs, to, to live off one job, to save another for five or 10 years, and then be able to pursue. And that goes with just being financially independent. That goes with being a business owner. Because a lot of times when you want to start a business, it's hard just to go to a bank and say, hey, I want to start this business. And they're going to say, well, what experience do you have? Or how much money do you have? It's a whole lot easier to go to the bank and say, hey, I want to borrow money when you have some money sitting in the bank. Or when you say, you know what, I have five or 10 years of experience doing this, so I know how to effectively run this business. I just need your help with the funds. Those are two totally different conversations that you have as an entrepreneur. All right. Next slide. So once again, what's keeping us from obtaining our great American dream? Auto loans, which I'll say, the average auto loan is $500 a, a month. Um, credit cards, we've already talked about the credit card debt. Um, student loans, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, I paid mine off because mine were low, but I think my wife will finish paying hers off next year when my son graduates high school. So that lets you know how long student loans can, can linger on. Mortgages, you know, it, it's 30 years. That's why they said try to pay them off soon. All right, next slide. All right, so here's some st statistics that have been out here. Uh, over a million families filed for bankruptcy in 2013. I just saw uh, it increases every single year, and I just saw that they're looking at over 2.5 million to 3.5 million will file bankruptcy this year simply because of COVID. Uh, credit card debt is soaring. Uh, it's higher than it's ever been. Uh, it's, it was already on the rise. And of course, this pandemic has things even worse. Uh, the average credit card debt is $15,000. Uh, and that was 2013. Now it's over $21,000. And the average interest rate paid on that debt, it used to be 15%. Now it's over 21%. How many of you all have looked at your interest rates on your credit cards and know exactly how much the interest rate is? Oh, somebody wrote it out and said, no, nah, not me. Okay. Uh, how many, oh, somebody, Holly says yes. Okay. How many of you all have gone to the website of that credit card and gone to the section? Every credit card website section has this. It says, if I pay the minimum, how long it'll take me to pay this off? And that's if you don't use that card again. How many of you all have done that? Somebody said, I cry. I know I saw somebody to tell that I cry. I promise you, I cry too. So, that just lets us know what, what it is that we have to do. We, we have to, and, and that's where having a second job or having a part-time job comes in because as we said, it takes more than just one person to run a household. Next slide. So let's use this example. I said earlier that interest rates were, they were just examples. So we're gonna use 15.3%. If you had a credit card balance of $15,000 and an interest rate of 15, 23%, how much of that debt is, how much is that costing you in debt every single year? Before, Sean, don't change it. Let, type in there what you think 
that is? How much do you think 15.3% of $15,000 is? If you have a calculator or a phone, go ahead, figure it out. If I could sing, I'd do that Jeopardy music, dee, 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 but I can't sing. Anybody? No one. All right. John, go ahead and give us the bad news. $2,300 per year on that $15,000 of the debt. If you did that for five years, if you could save that money, that's $11,000 on 15%. Now, I'm not saying you don't need a credit card because I really believe that sometimes if you don't have the cash, sometimes a credit card does work. But what if we could find a credit card with a lower interest rate, five to 8%? That'd be even better. Or if we could just pay that off and just have that $11,000 in five years. That's a nice little nest egg. It might not be what you need to start your business, or it might be what you need to start your business. But that's the kind of money that we're looking at. And that's what um, being able to manage your credit and manage your payments and having a budget. When you're not able to do those things, this is what happens when you get 15% interest rate. Same thing with the cars. The car dealerships do not care. You know, they're 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 approving everybody. Doesn't matter which, as long as you have a job or a proof of income, they're approving you. And they get you in, and you're like, oh, I need to stay within this budget. And you say, oh, I can do five or six hundred dollars a month. Great. You know what? They fit you into that car within that five to six hundred dollars a month budget. But what do they do? <laughs> as long as you have a heartbeat. <laughs> Look. But what do they do? They don't tell you what the interest rate is until you're in there with the finance manager. And by that time, you sat in the car, you drove it around the block, and you're like, ooh, that jalopy that I did have, ooh, I can upgrade. Guess what? They got you. How many times have you seen somebody go in that finance office and walk out without the car? Doesn't work that way. You, you, you've done it. <laughs> okay. Some people do it. But a lot of times, that's where they get you. All right, Sean, next one. And we're, we're wrapping this up. I apologize that we're a little bit behind schedule, but we'll get there. So what other problems are, um, and that's why I drive a Honda Accord. Yep, my son drives one, and, you know, and, and, and it's still, still knocking. There you go. Uh, what other problems are a direct result of having too much debt? When you have too much debt, you're always paying that debt, so you're not able to save. The savings rate in 1970 was 8%. What is it now? negative one percent um and that was as of last year uh it's probably worse now uh no source of emergency funds besides the credit cards a lack of insurance and of course uh, future planning problems no college fund for kids no retirement planning things like that we could go on and on so that's what happens when we number one we have to create a budget know where our money is going number two make sure we control all of our debt make sure we pay our debt on time that way our credit scores are, are decent. And then of course, as we know, credit scores are, that, that's a whole nother class that Professor Houston could teach, just understanding credit, understanding the debt ratio, understanding what's reported on the credit report, understanding how to manage it, what's the percentage of, you're looking at how long you've had credit, how um, you're looking at the types of credit, and you're looking at, um, you know, are your payments on time? All of that, th those are percentages that you have to manage as well as you also have to be very careful and understand that if I have a credit card and I have a $2,000 limit and I'm always at $1,700 to $1,800, my score is going to be lower. Whereas if I take that credit card and I only owe $300 to $500 on it, my score is higher. But we don't learn that in time. And by the time we learn it, it's like, oh, okay. So that's why we like to go out and reach people and say, hey, this is how we have to do these. But like I said, that's for another discussion. So let's move on to the next one. All right, so I always tell people, if I could show you how to reduce and eliminate all of your debt without taking any additional money out of your pocket or changing your current lifestyle, is that something that you could actually do? Sign next one. So here's the 10 steps that I say that we can actually do that. One, you have to set life goals. When I say life goals, it can be as simple as between now and the end of the year, I want to have $1,000 saved up. 
And then you go on to the next year, what your goals are, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. But you always have to have these goals. You have to have it written down. I am the worst person. My wife can tell you I have index cards taped on my mirror in my bathroom. I have sayings and I have goals. So that, that way, every day I know I can look at them. Now, when it comes to those life goals, you also have to say, okay, what am I going to do to help me get there? And I always tell people, if you have a goal, there have to be three steps that you use or three steps that you write down to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So let's take, for instance, we say we want to have $1,000 or $1,500 saved up by January 1st, 2021. What are we going to do? If you can't work any extra, if you can't work extra or overtime, what are we going to do? Do you have a pair of tennis shoes that you can sell? Do you have something in your closet that you don't need? Have your children outgrown the bassinet and the, all of that? Exactly. So what can you sell? What can you get rid of? Or what can you buy and sell? You know, a lot of people nowadays are using the internet to buy and sell things. Now, we're not talking about illegal things, so don't, don't go down that route. But what can you go and do? There's a vent, uh, what's the guy's name? I don't know if you all have ever heard, Vander Esch. Uh, he's big on social media. Uh, he used to work at his parents' uh, a liquor store for years. And, you know, he would sell, he would, only thing he would wear with jeans and the alcohol t-shirts that the uh, alcohol distributors would give to him. And he worked that business for 10 or so years, his parents' liquor store, and he saved all his money. And now he's big with social media content and everything. And he, Gary V, that's his name. Thank you, Holly. Gary V. And he go, and he literally still, to this day on Saturdays, drives around to garage sales and yard sales and buys things real cheap and then puts them on the internet and makes $1,000 in a weekend doing that. Number two is create a budget. Flips them on eBay. Yes. Holly, you want to teach this class for me? I got you. <laughs> um, create a budget. Goes back to what I was saying. 50, 30, 20 or at least make sure that you have all the line items of everything, everything from your car, everything from your uh, living expenses, as far as rent, as far as electricity, as far as water, gas, everything. Uh, put all of that in a line item and then start dividing up by wants, needs, and then saving. Emergency fund, that's the next thing that you have to start doing. Once you have your budget and you see where you're spending or where your dollars are going, create that emergency fund. Minimum is $1,000 just to get started, but the goal is to make sure you get three to six months saved up. Uh, plan to pay off your debt. What does it take to pay off that debt? You know, is it going to take overtime? Is it going to take working a weekend job? Um, whatever it takes to, to pay that debt off, that's what we need to do. Uh, start a retirement fund. Here's the thing. I love talking about retirement funds. That is my passion. But I will tell you, if you have a job and they're offering a 401k and they're matching, do not talk to me about anything until you sign up and you're taking that free money. If they're gonna, if they're gonna say, oh, if you save up 5%, we're gonna match you 3% and we're gonna match the same 5%, take it, max it out. Yes, go as whatever. Now, here's the thing. I always tell people to, to be very cautious when you're saying, I'm going to save 10%, but they're only going to match you five. There's some other things you could do. So if they're going to match you five, you, could, you do five, let them match you five. And then you take your other five and invest it somewhere else outside of that 401k. People ask me why. Here's the thing. If you ever lose, leave your job, lose your job, retire from whatever it is, never leave your money where they are. Why? Because you no longer really know until the quarter how they're spending or how they're managing your money. You always want to be in total control of your dollars. If you're there, if you're at Walmart, fine. Keep it there at Walmart. But the minute you leave Walmart or wherever you are, take your money and move it so that you're able to see and you're able to make immediate decisions on that. The next one is start investing. This is different than your retirement fund. Start investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, rental properties. I don't care if you're investing in baseball cards, hockey cards, football cards, anything that you know you can buy now and you know that it has the potential to appreciate over time, invest in it. How many of you know what the holy grail of the baseball, of the um, sports card industry is? How many of you have heard of it? The holy grail is Rain Gretzky. The holy grail includes Michael Jordan. 
the Holy Grail would include Walter Payton. Those three rookie cards right there, they're hard to get. They only had so many. I think they, they only made 10,000 of each one, and most of them got thrown away by people because they didn't believe the potential. But when you can find one in great condition and you have all three of them, I'm talking millions of dollars. Just having them over the past years and now, and then add another five years to that. What about Peyton Manning? If you have a rookie card of Peyton Manning, oh, look at you trying to get all those names now. <laughs> Wayne Gretzky, Walter Peyton, Michael Jordan. You have to find rookie cards. Uh, preferably Tops is the brand, and there's also another brand. But when you find those, um, what's the greatest one that left the Patriots and went to um, um, the Buccaneers? If you can find Tom Brady. Tom Brady, upper deck, yes, upper deck is great. That, that's the other. But yes, Tom Brady. If you can find that rookie card, ten or twenty years from now, it would definitely be worth something. All right, create an automatic savings plan. Whenever you get, I always recommend direct deposit. If they are, if your company offers direct deposit, always have different savings accounts and and put different percentages of your money in different accounts. So if you know that you're going to get a thousand dollars this week. Make sure that 10% goes to your savings account that you don't ever touch unless it's an emergency. And then you have the other 90%. That's what I always tell people. And then also the same thing can go for when you start investing. When you start investing in mutual funds and things like that, Fidelity, Vanguard, all of these companies, they will allow you to, to start investing with $50 or $100. It automatically comes out of your account. Also watch your credit scores. Everyone knows, get a copy of your free credit score every single year. Every year, take a look at it. Um, I keep all kinds of things uh, on mine. Uh, if I can show you on my phone, I have two that I monitor my credit with all the time, along with Capital One does monitoring uh, for you. But I have uh, my favorite one is Credit Karma. Uh, I love them because they automatically tell me when my credit score goes up, down, around, and sideways. Uh, credit Sesame is good because Credit Sesame, when you get that app, and you, if, you, if you don't mind doing it, it'll kind of give you some ideas of what you can do immediately to kind of boost your score. Now, once you do those things, it doesn't give you any more ideas. So, you know, I'll say get it, boost your score, get rid of it. But I always use Credit Karma. And then, of course, uh, if you have Credit uh, Capital One, whether it be an auto loan or credit card, they do a great job. And a lot of these credit card companies now are getting to the point to where they're kind of helping you. And you can see what your credit scores are. Uh, number nine, make sure you're protected with insurance. I always tell people life insurance, that's what I sell. Yes, you need to have it. Health insurance, yes. If, do not take a job, a full-time job, unless you are offered health insurance. I mean, you never know what's going to happen. Auto insurance and homeowners. Now, I tell people, with your auto insurance and your homeowners, every single year, shop it. I know you've been with the same person for the past five or 10 years. You call them and they know your name. Hey, Sean, how you doing? Hey, Professor Matt, I got you. Come on in here and then let me have your money. Uh-uh, shop it. Because if you've had no accidents, you've had no DUIs, DWIs, the insurance industry changes every single year. It changes every six months. How many of you all got money uh, during COVID when everybody was parked? I, I did. Hey, so if they're able to do that, that lets you know they were already overcharging you. That's his point blank bottom line. If they were able to give you two months free or two months at what, 10, 20% off, they were already charging you 10 to 20% too much anyway. So I say every year when it comes up for renewal, shop it. It doesn't matter. Oh, I've been with State Farm. State Farm is the most expensive insurance out there. Go to Progressive. If you're not with Progressive, check nationwide, check all state. Same thing with your, your homeowner's insurance. You have to be careful and be mindful. If you have homeowner's insurance and you have all state, I'll tell you another thing. If you build a house or have a new house or you just bought a house, well, the first five years, all state will be the cheapest. But in year six, you might as well move it because all state will go sky high and you will be paying more money than you need to. So I'm giving you all these tidbits about different companies that people never really think of. They say, oh, well, you know, that's my guy, that's State Farm guy. I've been, I've known him all my life. My mom and daddy had him too. 
doesn't matter. The last thing, continuous learning and maintenance. I always have email sent to me every morning. There's so many different financial companies out there that send out email. Listen to podcasts. I love listening to podcasts. My family would tell you I am on YouTube all the time. I love YouTube. I'll, you know, I type in something about financing, selling insurance, retirement, top 10 stocks, bonds, mutual funds, anything about finance. You will learn so much. YouTube University, yes. I, look, matter of fact, they're going to hire me real soon. They, I've been negotiating with them. They're going to hire me simply because I am on YouTube all the time. When I go exercise and walk, I put YouTube on and I listen to something on YouTube. Motivational about stocks, bonds, investments, whatever. That's what I do. And so I always tell people, in order for you to learn about it, you, you have to listen to it. You have to read, you know, 30 to 60 minutes a day. And if you read about your favorite topic or something that you're interested in, within the next four or five years, you reading 30 minutes to an hour a day, you become an expert. And that's pretty much what I did in my career, just studying, staying up, on internet, YouTube, podcast, just to learn so that I can, uh, uh, yes, identity protection too. Uh, that's a good thing. So these are the top 10 things. So you see it, if you want to write it down, I think Sean will leave it up a little bit. Uh, but if you have any questions, I'm pretty much done. And I know a lot of you all probably have families or got to get up for work. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm done. But these are the things that I really believe you have to start doing in order to keep your financial house in order. Um, so I'm going to allow uh, Professor Houston to open it up if you have any questions. Good deal. You're welcome, Holly. Mr. Ricks, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very, very much. Um, this is invaluable. One, uh, to everyone on here, I think one of the your last uh, point is continuous learning and maintenance. A lot of people think financial literacy is a one chapter type thing. So once you learn what your FICA score is, what insurance rates are, and then what plan, what savings and all of those things are one time, you don't have to hear it anymore. You've graduated. Well, if you continuously learn the new trends and, and brush up on what FICA scores are, um, a lot of things happen. One, you get to see your progress. Like as you were going through your presentation, I remember the days when I had the, the, the poor you know, credit score because of my credit card debt or the fact that I didn't have any assets to, that balance, counterbalance the debt that I owed. And so I remember those times and I remember getting some type of education throughout the years um, to, to help me get in a better position each time I hear it. So thank you for sharing that. I still have work to go to, I still have work to go, but I definitely feel encouraged um, by this. It's very important, um, and I want to thank you all, class, for your engagement. Um, it was really, really interactive. Um, I know this is not a business class, uh, business subject, but it's really important to know your personal financial, uh, have a healthy personal financial status, so that you can evolve into growing businesses. Because if you have a healthy business and you sell that business, it can help your personal debt as well. Um, one one solution that I did um, to get out of all the debt that I incurred in college um, was to have businesses that were worth selling. And one reason why I'm a serial entrepreneur is because I was able to um, make a profit uh, off of a infrastructure that I built, which allowed me to pay off a house, buy a car. That's not a Honda Accord. <laughs> things of that nature, right? And so um, that's that's a pro to entrepreneurship. Um, it's, it's, in my opinion, is the surefire way, if successful, to get out of debt in this existing American system. And so with that, I'll reserve all the, the rest of the time for questions, if anyone has questions. I think there was a question high in the chat that we didn't discuss. Oh, Kayla brought up a great point. Is it more important to save or pay your credit card debt faster? Javon, could you give us um, your insight or Sean, either one? All right, that's a great question. Uh, that comes up all of the time. 
Uh, here's what I say. If you don't have the thousand dollars, try to save that first. And once you get a thousand dollars, then let's start working on the credit card debt. And it, and it also depends on how much credit card debt you have. If it's just a couple thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, hurry up and try to do what it takes to pay that off. Yeah. Now, if it's ten or twenty thousand, you know, uh, you make an extra. You have an extra two hundred, five hundred dollars. Split it in half. Put some in savings, some to pay the credit card off. Because my thing is this: even though your credit, your credit card debt is out there. What happens when, when your engine goes out? You don't have any, your, your credit card debt's not gonna help you. But if you have some money saved up, that'll definitely help you. So I'll say, you know, kind of gauge it. Um, yeah. I like to make sure that I have a set amount of money already set aside. And then from there, what I like to do is I'll take a portion of it, pay off debt, a portion of it and keep it. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on that too. Uh, my view is very similar to what Javon just said. And, and I love the fact that um, Matt, or Professor Houston mentioned about what he did and how he used the business infrastructure and sold it to where he was able to pay down. Uh, when you start off in building your business, which is what I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna actually take uh, Javon's 10 and start from that to show you how it's better to always have control I really, the philosophy that I, I uh, have learned from actually running a business and operating a business is that it's better for you to have control. So I'd rather the money be in my account first in my savings account, right? And you're gonna learn that what I, I'm gonna talk about and how you operate a business is pay yourself first. I made that mistake one time and it, it will cost me dearly. So my suggestion is just what Javon said is and Matt also, uh, Professor Hughes also alluded to it. You want to kind of gauge it and then look at how much money you can control and then start making a plan to pay down that debt toward a specific goal of getting rid of that credit card debt in that case. Because that, and there are other techniques some people use. You may have heard of um, the, um, I forgot the one that they call it where they do the waterfall principle and you take it and you pay off enough debt. Um, and then you take that credit card debt you pay down, say it's $200 in interest and you paid it off and you take that $200 in interest and you start paying another credit card down. I forgot what they call that principle, but I, I, I've done all of them. And I can tell you, it's better for you to gauge it first and see and keep as much money as you can in your control and then try to pay down more each time, pay more interest down over time where you're not stuck in a situation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Thank hey, you. I see that there's a, there's a question in the, in the box um, and it's uh, referring to paying off credit card debt um, and not using the, the card. I think that's a challenge um, that one of our students had with Marcella. Um, and it's, she said that my challenge is paying off credit card debt and paying it off and not using it. It causes my credit card to drop. Um, one thing that, so that one thing that I do um, to help, help, help me out with that is when I do my budgeting, um, I assign bills that I know I'm going to get every month. First, I eliminate my credit card. Debt. You eliminate your credit card debt, we can have a zero, zero, zero balance. And then what I do is, Let's say I know I need water, electricity, something that I'm going to pay every month anyway, instead of me paying through my through a check or through my debit card, I put it on the credit card. And what I do is if I pay those bills on the fifth, I make sure I pay my credit card bill where all of my bills are one time, one part of the month. And so let's just say that's on the 20th. So I pay all of my bills with the credit card on the 5th. And then when the statement, my credit card statement uh, occurs on the 20th, I pay all my credit card, I get my money, and all those type of things. And that kind of helps you build, that helps build my credit score um, because I'm gonna spend that money anyway. Matt, that's a genius move, uh, just, just a comment. Um, the other thing it does is that it reduces your you don't pay any interest when you do that. Yep. That's one of the things it does because what happens when you pay your credit card debt off, 
a lot of people don't know, it's actually reverse, they reverse engineer the process. In other words, the more you pay credit, that's where you get rated a better credit score. You keep paying credit. They want you to stay in that cycle. Right. But once you pay it off, like Matt just used, and that's actually the system I use, Matt. I call it my cash flow management system because I learned that in managing a business and when I was managing cash flow, oh, this is a better move. I'd rather use a credit card, pay that, but allocate that money and pay that credit card off completely like American Express demands in their own ways of doing business and then drop it down to zero. You pay no interest and then your credit score will actually go up because you reduce your debt to income ratio. That's part of the formula that credit card issuers use. So Matt, is that's just ingenious. Um, I noticed also someone no, no said something about zero-based budgeting. So that's really good. You guys really have great concepts around budgeting. And But the way Javon just broke it down to you, I think, I hope it really helped you because I'm going to take the same slide and start from this when I start talking about how you operate a business and why you want to have done these 10 steps. Yeah, you all, you did a great job, Javon. This is a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I do want to say one thing that I do recommend, and I know um, most people that they learn this. It's nothing wrong with working a job. It, it's nothing wrong with working a job with the mindset of, okay, once I get X amount of knowledge or X amount of dollars, I'm going to leave this job and do what my passion is. Um, and you're going to have to take some stuff and you're going to run across people who they're just not going to like you just because they're not going to like you because you're smarter than them. They're not going to like you because you're reliable and they're not, who cares? Work that job and don't leave it until you're ready or until you have another job that's comparable and you don't have to take a step back, but you still have a job. I tell people, keep working that job before you go out there and pursue your passion. Because the worst thing is to go out there, don't have a job, you don't have enough knowledge, and then you're back looking for a job again. So even if you have the money set aside, when you find that, that business or when you find that opportunity, don't jump at the first one either. Because like my dad used to tell me, you know, um, my grandfather used to walk around and everybody knew it. He'd walk around with $3 in his pocket and he says, if it costs more than $3, I don't need it. Or either I need to go sleep on it and figure out if I really do need it. Just because an opportunity comes around, you know, I could come and tell you, oh, this is the best opportunity on this house. and You're gonna make X amount of dollars. And if you don't know anything about it or anything, you'll invest in it. Next thing you know, the whole foundation is a mess. That's why I'm scared to flip houses because <laughs> I'm afraid I'll find a house and I'll be ready to put my money in it. And I'll do all the, things that I need to do. And then all of a sudden, guess what? The kitchen is messed up. Mm -hmm. So be patient, take your time, work your job until the right opportunity comes. And, and, and that also helps you just being smart throughout uh, being a business owner. Awesome. Great parting words. Um, thank you all very much, uh, Javon, again. Sean, we can't wait to your presentation next week. Uh, students, if y'all have any questions, please feel free to contact me via Canvas message or email. I've finally caught up. Uh, thank you all again for your patience. Um, and thank you all for your uh, contributions to this class. Y'all have a great night. Thank you. Professor Houston, I have one question. Uh, okay, hold on, let me stop recording.